you strangled people. They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I mean, I could kill a person and just go out to dinner. I don't even care. <laughs> I'm about to be shown a brand new death chamber in a prison where no one's been executed for eight years. This is where the condemned man will have the final moments of his life. It's a clear signal that the state of Indiana fully intends to execute the 11 murderers on death row. I was here five years ago, but I've never been able to forget these men and their terrible crimes. And this could be my final encounter with them. I killed a cop, right? And when I was younger, I took pride in that. Like, dudes say, that's Richie, he killed a cop. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Mr. Bear, we meet again. They like to call me a baby raper, child molester, child molester, child molester. And I didn't molest no child. I killed a woman and her four-year-old daughter. And I regret when we did that. Since my last visit, a lot has changed. The prison is almost unrecognizable, caught in the grip of a rampant drugs epidemic. There's been a number of deaths, suicides. There's been a couple of murders. I've never seen this institution like this. Just Wow. And the latest man to arrive on death row is a serial killer. So you killed a greater number of people than the police know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They might have a tenth of it. I'll put it that way. You guys be safe. Welcome back to Indiana State Prison. Good morning. Good morning. Today, Warden Ron Neal is making his regular visit to death row. Good morning, good morning. Inmates here are isolated Great. from How the rest you? of the prison population. Today, we have 11 men here on X row. You might remember, Trevor, some of these gentlemen since you were here last. Um, Fred Bear. Yes, uh, we certainly talked to him. Right. Fred's a big talker. Obviously, he's very fond of his cat. And uh, Mr. Ritchie? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ben Ritchie. Any new arrivals? Uh, Mr. Gibson. Yes. 108. And uh, Mr. Isom and 120. So we're heading into death row, it's in death row itself now? Yeah, this is the actual cells of death row. These men all live with the knowledge that one day they'll be told precisely when they'll die. For the time being, there's a hiatus. Manufacturers are refusing to supply the drugs for lethal injections. Should they become available again, first in line to be put to death is a man who has been on the row for 15 years, Benjamin Ritchie. When we last met, he described the mad moment that sealed his fate. Well, my crime is shooting a police officer and killing him. You know, if that bullet would have hit just half of an inch lower, he'd be alive today. And I'd, I'd probably have a long, lengthy prison sentence, but I wouldn't be on death row, man. Mr. Ritchie, how are you? Pretty good. good. We meet again. Yeah. It's been a while. I wasn't quite sure whether you would be still here when we last. I wasn't talked. either, and it, it's pretty. It was pretty close now, right? Like I don't like I could get a date at any time, but and ain't no companies, thank God, are going to sell these sell this place any drugs. You know what I mean? What do you think of that? Is that a source of hope for you about some change to Hell your? Oh yeah, like I hope to go to population, like you know. Uh, so in the general prison population. Yeah. What has life been for you since I last saw you? Shit, man. All kind of stuff's happened to me, man. I just got my visits back. I lost one for about two years. What happened? How, I, was how having, you... I was having sex in the visiting room. You're not <laughs> supposed to do that, though, are you? It was worth it, though, man. It was worth it. It was the best minute, 30 seconds of my life. <laughs> really? But, I mean, you knew, you knew what the consequences would be. Yeah. I knew what I was doing. I knew a little blind spot here or there, you know what I mean? And it was on. It was worth it. She's bad, bro. Like Victoria's Secret model type bad. 
the last time we talked, you talked about relationships on the row here. How's that? How are they? Same situation still down there with that one, you know what I mean? Like, I hate that dude so much. Yes, you're talking about Frederick Bear. Yeah, Susie. We call him Susie. Why do you call him that? Because he's like a sweet, like a, a Susie cube. We used to have him on commissary, like a little cupcake. And he's a soft, he's soft like a cupcake, right? I hate him so much, but I don't want to see the prison kill that dude. I'd rather see him in population getting the shit stabbed out of him or beat up for what he did, you know what I mean? Do you know Mr. Gibson downstairs? Yeah, I know him. That's my old, that's my old buddy. He's all... Yeah. Now, that's a real serial killer. Uh, why do you say that? Look at his case, man. That old man's been doing it a long time, you know? William Clyde Gibson has the perverse distinction of being the only serial killer on Indiana's death row. In April 2012, police discovered Christine Whitus dead and mutilated in Gibson's garage. Gibson is charged with two other Floyd County murders, and one is a decade-old cold case. He's a dangerous man who I believe, given the opportunity, would do this again. He's never spoken publicly before about his conviction for killing and mutilating the bodies of three women. We've got the camera crew today, Mr. Gibson. Do you have a minute to talk to these folks? Actually, I've got lots of minutes. I was here five years ago, but you, you weren't here. I didn't, didn't, didn't meet you then. How do you get on with the other guys on the road? Fine. <laughs> ah, there's a couple of them I could kill and wouldn't think a thing about it, but you know. Maybe, maybe, it's not, maybe it's not wise for you to say that. No, they know. I told them already. I mean, you know, it's just what it is. I'm not going to lie about it. Do you have any regrets about ending up here as you have? No. <laughs> None. I know I'm a piece of shit. I did the things I did, and I knew what I did. So, you know, it wasn't like... Uh, I didn't know it was coming. <laughs> I, I just wish he had gone and built it. It's a strange thing to hear people say that they're waiting to die or quite willing to speed up the process. I'm sure when it comes right down to it, I won't want to go. You know, that's obvious. We, we're around for a few days. I hope we can see you again. All <laughs> right. That'd be fine. Thank you. You guys have a good one. Today, the entire prison is unusually quiet. On my last visit, these recreational areas teemed with prisoners. Not today. The facility is on a state of high alert. The tension is palpable. So Captain Boyan escorts me to C Block, the largest cell house in the prison. Almost all the 400 inmates here are convicted murderers serving long sentences. For weeks, they've been confined to their cells for 24 hours a day. It's lunchtime, but you'd never know it. No one is allowed out. Captain, why is the prison in lockdown? Uh, we had a string of medical emergencies. We call them Signal 3000s. Um, and we believe it was due to overdoses on K2 or Spice, uh, which is a synthetic marijuana. How bad did the me medical emergencies get? Um, at one time, there, we had a weekend where we had approximately 40. 40 in one weekend? Yes. Mm -hmm. And how long has this uh, prison been in lockdown in this day? Currently, it's uh, been a month. A month? Yes, sir. They're locked in their cells all day, except every three days, we will escort them to the shower to shower. But anytime they come out of their cell, they have to be handcuffed and escorted.
Hello. What's your name? Christopher Pavey. Christopher Pavey. And uh, how long have you been here? A total of 30 years. You've been here for 30 years. And have you experienced lockdowns like these before? In my whole entire prison sentence, there's only been one time that we've been locked down as much as we've been locked down now, and that was back in the 90s. The situation that we're going through right now, though, we've never experienced this. Have you seen people get oh, yeah. distressingly ill from right. spice? Yeah. I've, I've seen a dude die from it. Yeah. Seen a guy when die when from was it. that? Uh, about four months ago. As we looked on, prison staff were called to yet another medical emergency nearby. This man would eventually be returned to his cell. There was no explanation about the cause of his seizure. But the talk of the prison is the lockdown, and to that, there is no end in sight. Many of the offenders here, gang members and drug dealers, are skilled at playing the system. But what must it be like to be sent here at the age of 15? That's what happened to Ronald Sanford. I clearly remember our first meeting five years ago. I've never been to the prom. I've never driven a car. I've never had a driver's license. I've never filed tax returns. Uh, uh, <laughs> I've never been on an airplane. I've never traveled abroad. <laughs> Should I continue? My life has been living in this prison, and it seems as though I've been in this prison so long that I've never been free. What shocked me then, and still does, is how, at the age of 13, he killed two people. <laughs> this is Indiana State Prison's death row. Frederick Bear's crime has made him the most hated man here. Am I a cold, sadistic murderer? Where I can cut a little girl's throat? A five-year-old girl's throat? No. I love kids. I can still recall the afternoon he told me about the murders. High on drugs, he broke into the home of a mother and her four-year-old daughter. So I knocked on the door, and a little kid answered the door. Her mom came to the door, and uh, my intentions was to rape her. I couldn't go through with it, but it, it, I'd already gone too far. If I killed them, nobody would never know. And so I cut their throats. I cut both of their throats. I've never believed in the death penalty myself, and I've, I've always been against it, and I probably still am. But when I think about what you do, I begin to understand why people feel it should be the appropriate sentence for crimes like yours. Do you understand that? Spring, open 206. Mr. Bear, what's happened, if I may ask, to your eye? Things occurred and just situation happens with, you know, not anticipating and expecting and something like this took place. Everybody on this row has been convicted of murder. Yes. Of one kind or another. But you are discriminated against. For what? Because of what you did. You heard it when you came in. Baby killer, baby killer, and all the ranting and raving, and the constant being called Susie, and being attacked, and having urine squirted on you, and having spit in, and having dope drugs and chemicals put in your food. 
having semen put in your food, having bleach put in your food, that's not good. You, you don't, you have to understand that when you have bleach put in your food, you're not liked. <laughs> Being called a baby raper, baby raper, baby raper from the guy who lives directly below me, and then having people believe that, that I'm a baby raper, in which I promised you on all that I love, I'm not uh, a baby raper. I killed a mother and her child. Due to this situation, I'll probably have to live the rest of my life in isolation. Because I know that if I go out in population, I'm a dead man. How do you manage to cope with such rampant hostility? It, it seemed like sometimes death would be a better relief. Lockdown is finally over, after five weeks. The prison believes it has dealt with the flow of drugs, for now. Convicts who had been confined to their cells for 24 hours a day were now free to go out into the fresh air, if only for a short time. Excuse me. I headed off to see a prisoner who may well have faced the death penalty had he not been a child when he killed two people. Instead, Ronald Sanford is serving a sentence of 170 years. Mr. Stanford. Good afternoon. I still see you have all your all your books. Well, yeah, I have some of them. Yeah. Reading is my livelihood for the most part, you know. It's something to put your mind to, you know. So to read and write, you, know, it, it, you have to apply yourself. You can lay down and watch TV all day. And this how you be. I remember you had all these sayings, yes. Sayings on right your here. No, and I, this is and Nelson Mandela say. Yeah. Oh, yes. yes, sir. From Robin Island. Madiba, yes. He spent 26 years in Robin Island. He, hero of yours. Yeah. yeah. I, I did the first interview when he came out from Robin Island. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Grab a chair. Yeah. Have a seat. Uh, yeah. yeah. I find it extremely difficult to imagine you're coming into this prison at the tender age of 15. 20, 30, 40, all in prison. Yes, sir. Do you reflect on the event that got you here, the crime that got you here? Uh, I think about my crime every day in some manner. It's unshakable. You never get away from it. And I think about it all the time. You know, I don't talk about it because um, I don't talk about it. Five years ago, he explained to me how he came to murder two of his neighbors. Me and a friend had basically uh, planned to get money to go to a fair. And to do so, we're going to cut grass. And we went to a home, basically, and they said they didn't want their grass cut. And rather than continue on the vein and go to the next home, we decided to push into the home, essentially. Ronald Sanford was 13 years old in 1987. Police say Sanford tortured, beat, and then brutally stabbed 83-year-old Anna Harris and 87-year-old Julia Belmar countless times. Tonight, the deputy prosecutor said Sanford's lengthy criminal record indicates he's beyond rehabilitation. I, I take the point that you don't talk about it very much, but what happened to you that day? 
um, I was actually home alone. My mom had actually left me and went out of town with her boyfriend and left me home alone that day. And? The crime happened. You say your mother had been out of town but with her boyfriend. Do you in any way blame her, her absence? <laughs> I, um... No, I don't blame my mom. No. My mom did the best she could, you know, with what she had to raise her children, you know. My mom was an alcoholic on welfare, you know. She had many suitors. She was violent in her parenting, you know, and she used the tools that she had as a parent. And I really feel that I was trained to kill. You think you were trained to kill? Yes, sir. How so? My mother was a very violent person. How does that transfer from right. the mother's behavior to a double homicide? To a thirteen year old. Yeah. And a double homicide. It's easy to get to the violence if you've already been in the gas. You know, mm -hmm. you've been in the violence. It's easy to be violent. Children become what they see. They mimic the examples that they they follow. Often, my mother was, was fond of saying, you do what I do, you do what I say, and not what I do. Well, you should tell your child, you do what I say, and you do what I do, because I don't think you would want your child to see you do some stuff that you wouldn't want them to mimic. How's your mother doing now? Yeah. My mother, of course, has gotten older, you know, um, and she's thankfully uh, well. Uh, over the years, my mom has been the person who has been there for me. In fact, my mom is due to visit here tomorrow. She's, she, <laughs> I can't wait to see my mom. Listen, you've always been terribly good and frank with us. Thank you so much for talking to me. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you. See you again, Sir Trevor. Talk to you. Outside of the place. It's good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Oh, wow. <laughs> Last year, across the United States, 23 men were executed. At Indiana State Prison, 11 men await their execution date. After 35 days in lockdown, they've been released from their cells. They can now have four hours of recreation a day. They're unshackled, and free to walk within the confines of death row. During this time, the area is off limits to prison staff and visitors. So you're off lockdown now. Huh? Oh yeah. They're gonna let us out for rec so people can call their families because the dudes ain't talked to their families in about a month, right? Is Mr. Bear gonna come down here with you guys? Oh no. Why not? Because he'd be attacked, he'd be killed. He, he's that unpopular. Yeah. yeah. But why? He's got dudes' cell phones taken from them. Uh, he's told on everybody. So it's more about Absolutely. his conduct Absolutely. and listen, not listen. what he did. Listen, I, what he did was terrible, and I, 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 can, I, you know, I don't condone it. It's horrible to attack a woman and child. I don't give a shit about that. It's how you conduct yourself in here and what you've done in here what brought these repercussions on you. I mean, I've already attacked him once and beat him half to death. He's been beat up four or five times, you know. He broke his arm, you know. Why did you attack him? Because he accused me of stealing something from him, right? I, I don't steal. When you accuse somebody of stealing something, you got to face those consequences. Well, i got to go, man. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. you guys be safe. Be yeah. One prisoner no longer worries about getting into trouble on death row. He's not here anymore. Paul McManus killed three members of his family. He spent 13 years on death row, but on appeal, his sentence was reduced to life without parole. It was judged that he was mentally unfit to stand trial at his original hearing. 
The last time we were here, the only time you came out this way was when you had to get your insulin, your yeah. insulin jabs. Yeah. And do you have to do that now? No. How, how do you account for the change? Why not? Well, I, I just eat better. Right. Um, so the diet yeah. on death row was tied up with your well, needing that injection every day. Right. Well, you, you sit around and you eat chips and drink soft drinks so much because you don't really worry about the size that you get or, or the way you feel or, you know, stuff like that. Tell me about the moment you heard that you were coming off death row and that you were going to be put in general population. I, I had mixed emotions. Because, I don't know, when you're on the road, you have 30 days before you're executed. You get to say goodbye to your family and your friends and, and, and you get to spend time with people that you care about. Uh, and here now, I'll die and I won't get to say nothing. It's strange to hear someone talking about death in a death chamber as being preferable to living with the uncertainty of this rather well-structured freedom, as it were. If I could go back today, I would. If they said you got 30 days, I'd say, okay. Does that mean that you're not enjoying the, oh, no. the freedom of general population? No, I'm not enjoying this at all. This is, this is, uh, I mean, this is punishment. It really is. People don't realize that, but it really is. It's worse to spend the rest of your life in prison. I'm, I'm guilty as can be for the crime I committed. It, it hurts me every day. Yes. I have to live with it, that I took three people's lives. They're no longer here because of me. On the morning of February 26, 2001, McManus found out that his wife had filed for divorce. That evening, he killed her and their two children, Lindsay and Shelby. After the murder, he drove to the Twin Bridges and jumped from the top. Yeah, I can see him. Oh my God, he just jumped. He was pulled from the frigid February waters and went on trial a year later. I jumped 17 stories to end my life that night. But for some reason, I'm, I'm here. I don't know why. I was trying to kill us all. We'd all be together in heaven. Since I last saw you, you have three tattoos, or you have a tattoo. Well, I did it for the three people that I killed. It's not I'm, I'm proud of them. I, I cry so much that I don't cry anymore. The way I look in the mirror, I'm shaving or brushing my teeth or whatever, I will see that. That goes back to I never forget why I'm here. If McManus is to be believed, he faces an even harsher punishment than execution. Decades of time living with the darkest memories of his horrendous crimes. The current unavailability of the drugs required for executions has led some death row prisoners here to hope that they too may never be put to death. Such a hope might be premature. This gray building in a quiet corner of the prison houses a brand new death chamber. That would suggest that Indiana is not about to abolish the death penalty. Bill Wilson, the warden when I was last here, has had a role in many executions. Uh, and this is where somebody's life will end. Yes, uh, some of the, the nice parts about this new building is that we have better viewing um, arrangements for the family members and over here for the offender's family. Oh, so, so they're separated. And they are separated. The uh, paradox is new building, new execution chamber, but nobody has been executed here for eight years. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Society isn't sure where it stands with the death penalty and the movement has been to make sure that it's very difficult 
to secure the drugs necessary to carry out the execution humanely. Put more starkly, the drug manufacturers don't want to be associated with something that kills people. That is correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Their intent was for medical purposes, and they don't see this as a medical procedure. Yeah. Might they bring back the electric chair or something? Absolutely not. Any of us that have ever had an opportunity to be a part of that process uh, would, would, I think, defend against that. So we may be on the brink of a tremendous change in the way things were. I think in the state of Indiana, we are on that brink of, of possible change. I think as a, as a country, I think that at some point, uh, every state will be faced with the same challenges and decisions that Indiana's um, in the process of making, yes. Away from death row, the great majority of men in this prison will be well over the age of 70 before they're released. The oldest man I met last time still works in the prison barbershop. Rick Parrish was 67 when we spoke before. He's been working here for 42 years. It's neutral territory for gangs, for officers. I mean, if you come to the barbershop and you're a gang member, would you start trouble with a guy that's standing here with a pair of shears in his hand like this? I uh, know I wouldn't. I suspect not, too. No. I, I, that's why there's no trouble in here. Hello, Rick. How are you today? Good to see you. I'm Good all right. Good to see you. Good to How see you, you again. How's, how's work in the barbershop? Uh, well, you know, we've been down for five weeks, so everybody's brother wants a haircut. In the lockdown? Yeah, the shop's messed up. I got a mop clean this weekend, because it's in bad shape. Remember, you had pictures on the wall the last yeah, time. Yeah, I still have got... Them. I put you on the wall. Am I on the wall? There and there. The images on this wall catalog Parrish's life since he came to Indiana State Prison. He was convicted of armed burglary and the kidnapping of a mother and two children. He was given three life sentences, surely a death sentence in all but name. All the pictures here, you have it on, mounted on cardboard. Yeah, it's on cardboard, so if I ever get out, I can take it with me as a reminder. You don't want to go back. When I saw you last, you did talk about the possibility of a life on the outside. That's not going to happen. I'm 72 going on 73. I got 42 years in here. You know, that's not going to happen. You just have to face reality. It must be tough to resign yourself to ending your years oh, yeah. in prison. We just lost two guys. Last week, uh, and we lost three because one of them died over an ICL house of a heart attack. Those people who died were they were they old people, your yeah. colleagues? Yeah, they're uh, right around my age. If, around the seventies. Yeah, mm -hmm. most of them that's died recently are younger than me. If I remember, you constructed this board in this way, so that when you left, you could take it with you. Yeah, yeah, that's, but. Uh, Everybody says, well, what are you going to do with it uh, uh, if you don't leave? I said, well, I'm going to leave it there and they can deal with it. <laughs> I don't care. You know, when you're dead, you're dead. You can't take it with you. It's, it's good seeing you again, Rick. Yeah, you too. Been five years. Uh, five years. Somebody told me uh, last time I talked to him that you was uh, five years older than me. Um, I, I think that's probably right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you look I'm, in I'm good gonna shape. Be, I'm going to be all right. Two years after Rick Parrish's conviction, the criminal code changed, allowing for lighter sentences. That means he would have been a free man today. 
Instead, Rick Parrish knows he'll probably die in this place. My visit to this prison was nearly at an end. The five-week lockdown played havoc with prison routine and family visits. Now that it's been lifted, Ronald Sanford can see his mother Pamela again. She was only a limited presence in his childhood, but for some 28 years, she's been his only regular visitor. Ronald. Good afternoon. How are you? Again. All right, I'm going to come around in front. Your mother, does she talk a lot about her life when you, she comes to see you like this? Well, we just talk about general stuff. My mom made a change in her life in... 90s. She used to be alcoholic. She hasn't had a drink in since 92. She's a different person now than she was when she was raising me. And she's a parent. To see where my mom came from, to see who she is now, <laughs> it's just, oh, man, I couldn't be more proud of her. Sanford's mother was in court that day to hear her 15-year-old son sentenced to 170 years. That's my kid, and I don't think it's right. That's it. What subjects do you avoid talking about when you see your son? Um, the murder itself. Um, why did it occur? And we never talk about that. Ronald said to us he thinks of his early life as having been a training for murder. It's an extraordinary thing to say. Wow. I've never heard that. No. Before. Uh, and I imagine if that's the way he felt, then that's what it was. I didn't see that. No. no of course, you know, you, uh, even the night that the murder occurred, we sat myself and him, we sat on the back of my Cadillac and watched the forensic people and everybody bring the bodies out and everything because it was next door to where we lived. And I looked at him and there was nothing there that made me know that he was the one, nothing. So I had no clue ever that, you know, my lifestyle trained him up to be a murderer. I never knew that. Never thought that. The shock of hearing that your son had been sentenced to a prison term of 170 years must have been immense. I was crying so bad. It's like a horrible rainstorm. When the rain is coming down so hard you can't see, you have to pull over. That's how my tears were. It was hard, very hard. Such a sentence must lead you to think that you may never see him outside again. I used to think that, yes. But now I don't think that, no. I've prayed and asked the Lord to bring him out of here. So he's coming. He's coming home real soon. <laughs> A sentence of such length would probably not be given today. Recently, the U.S. Supreme Court compelled states like Indiana to decide whether it's right to punish juveniles as though they were adults. Oh, okay, so where'd you get the hair from? <laughs> I said I wasn't going to cut my hair until I got out of prison. Oh, okay. Okay, well, it's going to still be short because it ain't going to be long. That means for those like Sanford, who were mere children when they committed murder, they may one day be free. <laughs> I love you, I love you, I love you. 
On my final day at the prison, I requested to see one of its most notorious inmates again. But this time, away from his death row cell. 108. William Clyde Gibson is the only serial killer here. His murder of three women drew statewide attention. Bam, Missy. Been close to Gibson was arrested in April 2012 after the discovery of 75-year-old Christine Whitus dead in his garage. Police say he strangled and sexually assaulted her, then cut off her breast. Prosecutors argued Gibson lured her to his New Albany home to talk about his mother's recent death. She and Whitus were best friends. They found the body of missing Charlestown woman Stephanie Kirk in Gibson's backyard. Medical experts determined Kirk had suffered a broken back, and detectives say she was strangled to death by Gibson. They also charged him with a decade-old cold case. Karen Hadella washed up on the banks of the Ohio River near Clarksville in 2002. Police say they're looking into other missing persons cases right now, and they say it's possible there could be more bodies out there. It raises the question, how did someone described by his neighbors as a kindly, church-going man, become a multiple murderer. Mr. Gibson, thank you very much for talking to, agreeing to talk to us. Please have a seat. You grew up in New Albany in this state. What was your childhood like? Like everybody else, I had a good childhood. I mean, everybody thinks when you do the type of stuff I've done, cutting them up and, you know, all that kind of egregious stuff they think automatically for some reason that it's because you had a bad childhood, you were molested, or you asked you if you started fires and all this stuff. I didn't do none of that. You didn't? No. Had a perfectly normal childhood. The first woman you killed was Karen Hodella, a 44-year-old woman who you'd never met. Why did you kill her? Just felt like it. I don't know. I mean, I didn't have to have a reason. And then you killed somebody who was a friend of your family, your mother's friend. Yeah. Christine Wittis. She caught me uh, cutting up another one. So, and then she told me she was going to call the police. <laughs> How did you kill her? Strangled her. Uh, just trying to discover whether there's any part of your mind, any part of your, I use the word loosely, humanity, which says that this is appalling. Yeah, I don't believe I got any of that. Humanity. You have no humanity? I don't think I do. <laughs> you have no remorse at all about any of the people you murdered? It just don't, don't seem to affect me. I mean, I could kill a person and just go out to dinner. I don't care. <laughs> the only time I ever got any kind of feeling about it at all was the rush I got when I was doing it. I mean, you know. You got an adrenaline rush from killing people. I guess it was more than that, too. I mean, I got a kick out of cutting them up. I mean. You get a kick out of cutting them up? Yeah. Seemed like after the first one, it just got good to me, you know? At first, I was kind of nervous about it. But then after the first one, it was like, it wasn't just women. I mean, they was men, too. They, was, they just didn't find none of them. I didn't tell them about none of them, so, you know. So you killed a greater number of people than the police know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They might have a tenth of it, I'll put it that way. <laughs> so you may have killed 29, 30 people? Mm-hmm. Yep. Are you prepared now to tell the authorities where those bodies are buried? No. You never no. will? Mm-mm. I'm not going back, going through all that court stuff. Just not going to do it. Do you feel any sense of remorse. I've done a lot of bad shit. I'm right where I belong. 
Believe me, <laughs> they don't want me out. Get me home, mister. I was left numb with the shock of listening to Gibson's confessions to his crimes, delivered so casually and punctuated with that unnerving chuckle. William Clyde Gibson's crimes explain more clearly than I could ever do why many Americans support the death penalty. As for me, I will not easily forget the men I met at Indiana State Prison. Their faces, their life stories, and the crimes they committed. From the bone of Cain With a little drop of poison In a red, red blood She need a way to turn around the bend She said I want to walk away And start over again There are things I've done I can't erase I want to look in the mirror See another face I said never but I'm doing it again I want to walk away And start over again Shake my thirst in a cool, cool pot. That's a winner, never replaced.